Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Citizens wishing to speak. Lynn Baldini uh, is asked to speak uh, uh, today uh, as we start to talk about uh, items on the agenda. Uh, under announcements, the uh, Lamar Hunt and 11th Annual Memorial Ride to benefit Georgia uh, Sheriff's Youth Association. Uh, Sheriff Kelly, do you want to come forward and talk about this a little bit? Uh, yeah, this ride, uh, we, we named it in honor of Lamar Hunt, who used to be our jail administrator. We lost, uh, this is the 11th annual one. It's going to be on September the 13th. Uh, registration begins at 8.30 at the senior center across from the jail. Uh, kick stands up at 10 o'clock. All the proceeds from it goes to support the Georgia Sheriff Youth Homes. It's a good ride. We usually have about 100 riders. And that's police escorted, and I don't know where we're going yet, but we'll find a good route and try to stay out of the road. You got any idea on over those 11 years how much money uh, you've raised? I don't. I wish to. If I knew about it beforehand, I'd get it for you. But it, it usually does real well. It's not It's not real expensive, right? It's like $35 for a bike. And like I said, we sell t shirts and we usually give a t shirt to everybody that comes and rides. And we have a dinner, we go somewhere to eat lunch and get a break up from there and everybody's on their own. It's always a good time. We try to bring some of the kids from the youth homes down so everybody can see where their money's going. It's, last year we rode two to youth homes themselves, so everybody had a good time with that. That's super. Thank you very much for doing it. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I would like to have uh, Michael Justice, if he'd come forward and talk about uh, an event coming up this uh, weekend out in our park. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, I should point out to you that Pastor Franklin is also an employee of the county. He's worked with us for a number of years in Parks and Recreation at Mount Taylor Park. So we're, we're certainly glad to have him as a, as a member of our staff. Very positive influence. This coming Saturday night, August 16th, out uh, here, New Veterans Park, our, our first family movie night event that we'll hold here. Uh, the activities will begin about 7 o'clock. The movie probably won't start till 8.45 or 9 when it gets good and dark. Leave your pets and your alcohol at home. Um, bring your blankets, your chairs, and enjoy an evening with us. It's supposed Rio to be pretty weather too, too, so. Rio 2 is the movie. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This time I'd like uh, to invite Pete Giannis and Devin Seaball with Metro Atlanta Ambulance Service uh, talking about uh, uh, what all you're doing with Metro and uh, thank you for solid tennis on there. Mark Manning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, guests. It's an honor to be here before you today and I'm going to just give you a quick oversight overview of what we've done here at Metro Atlanta uh, as your new ambulance provider. There's some fast facts. Uh, on the 21st of December, we took over uh, 911 for uh, and the ambulance service. Uh, we re acquired Clark Ambulance Service and we retained 100% of the employees through the transition. Uh, we currently have, with our current operation and the folks that we gained through with Clark, over 150 residents or employees that live here in Paulding County, and we're very proud of that. Uh, our ambulance service was the second actually the third ambulance service in the southeast to be accredited by the Commission of Accreditation of Ambulance Services. That is one of the highest honors that uh, a service can receive. It's uh, a, a tedious amount of work. It shows that you do not only uh, clinical, but also that you, you focus on other pieces of operational excellence. They consider it the gold standard. So we're very happy to have that. And then um, just so you have an idea of some of the other things that we do, we also have advanced life support, hospital to hospital transports. We provide critical care transports, bariatric transports. We work with a, a, uh, the folks out of, out of uh, critical care air flight in Gwinnett, and we do air transports with them also uh, on the fixed wing side. Uh, we're not affiliated with anybody on the rotor wing or the helicopters, but on the fixed wing we do s several of the transports. And then we do special operations. We are contracted as the NDMS 
uh, folks, so when uh, there is an incident going on like Katrina or Rita and the patients are flown into Dobbins Air Force Base, uh, Metro Ambulance is in charge of doing the logistics work not only to, to transport the patients but also to find facilities to house them, et cetera. And we do this with the Cop Douglas Health Department and we're very proud of that. So that's essentially a, a few facts, fast facts about us. But I, I want to talk about what we've done here at Paulding. And uh, you've probably noticed that the uh, traditional ambulances have been changed. Uh, our platform went to Mercedes after Ford uh, decided that they would no longer be doing the E-Series. Uh, everything we had up to that point was a Ford ambulance. And the diesel E-Series with the cutaway went away. And with that, we had to go out and basically do a, uh, a search to find out what to replace it with. And we had our employees be a big part of that, and they had a lot of buy-in into it. And after we uh, did a lot of reviewing, we found out that for performance, safety, and uh, most importantly, that the patient care in the back, because you, know, you can imagine how important it is to be able to have a smooth, comfortable ride when you're performing a lot of the things that we do in the back of an ambulance. And the Mercedes Sprinter came out ahead and had a, had a very good report. So that was essentially one of the reasons we we flipped over, we had, we had no choice. But we've got a lot of benefits out of it. It's a green vehicle, it's clean diesel. It uh, gets about 14 miles per gallon instead of five, like our <laughs> previous vehicles used to get. And the maintenance is much, much lower, so we're, we're very happy with that. Uh, all our ambulances are fitted with ADL or GPS, however you wanna call it, so we have a constant feed. Uh, we, we ping about every three to four seconds so we know exactly where everything is at all times. We're able to perform uh, a cookie trail so if someone wants to know where's the ambulance been, we can actually backtrack it and find out where it's come from and what it's done that day. Uh, we've made some improvements also. We, we brought in, uh, every ambulance here has the, has the physio control for Medtronic's Life Pack 15. That is considered the gold standard in EMS. It has every gadget you could possibly put on it, Bluetooth, etc. We're able to send uh, EKGs via cellular wave to the hospital. So eventually when uh, the hospital here gets uh, to the open heart criteria, which I, I hope one day they will soon, uh, we'll be able to send EKGs from the field, not only the Wellstar, Kennestone, or Cobb, but also out here and be able to uh, eliminate a lot of, of the time when there's a STEMI event going on or any kind of cardiac call. The next piece we have is, is, is kind of a, uh, it's very unique. We're only one of uh, three services in the Southeast that have it. We were the only one in Georgia. We were the first in Georgia to have it. And uh, it is a CPR device that also from Physio that does, as they call it, perfect CPR. And it can deliver, you set the rate on however many uh, compressions per minute and it, it'll perform it. So <clears throat> this is uh, one of the things that we're looking at but we're really pushing hard on is patient outcomes. Um, it's, it's great to get there fast, it's great to get you to the hospital, but we want you to leave the hospital in the best possible condition possible. So this device, uh, which is new to the market, has really made an impact in our medical direction, which is under Emory Healthcare and the, and the hospital system and university. Uh, is doing a white paper to show once we get another year's worth of data the improvements in the outcome of patients after they have gone through an episode uh, where we've used the Lucas device to perform pneumatic CPR on the back of an ambulance. The last piece is a needle rentoscope, which is basically with fiber optics it shows the trait going down the esophagus to be able to show if we've got a perfect uh, insertion where we're doing ET tubes or anything that will enhance the survivability. So we're trying to stay stay out of a person's stomach, make sure we're in the right track. So anyway, uh, with this, uh, we are, to the best of my knowledge, you're the only county that, uh, along with Cobb, that has all three components were considered the gold standard in, uh, in capital equipment patient care. We also added and improved upon the, the Zoll computer software that we have. We use this old billing. It's all tied in together, so it's a very, very good piece of equipment to have, and it enhances our ability for reporting, which you'll see in a minute, what kind of reports we're able to pull out of this. Every ambulance also has drive cam, which is basically monitors the driving. It's a camera system that, that 
continuously rolls, and if there's an, an event, uh, a sharp turn or break or an accident, it, it will show approximately five seconds before and after the accident, anywhere around the vehicle. So if anything occurs, we'll, we'll know exactly what happened and we can roll it back. And also, it, it, it also works on the, the behavior of, of the medics that are driving because they, they, um, they actually know that they're being reviewed. And it's done by an outside source. We don't do it internally, so it, there's no bias involved. And these folks review their driving, and every every medic's given a report card, so we know where they stand every month. But it kind of closes our loop on the safety part of the driving and the CQI part. And uh, last but not least, I'm happy to announce: last week we closed at 260 International Highway, our first uh, new station, and it's about a 7,500 square foot building behind the hospital. And we're very pleased to have that, and we'll have our uh, our headquarters there, along with supplies, training, and a few other things. And we'll have no, not the 24-hour ambulances running out of it, but the day units that will be running out of that station. Um, we've put a lot of emphasis on training and education. Uh, we, we did a, a really, uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to tell you, with the employee orientation, we did a, uh, a lot of testing, uh, OSHA compliancy, which is something that um, if you don't stay on top of it, it will mount up and you'll end up being non-compliant and you never know when you get a visit from somebody from the federal government. So it's always good to stay ahead. Uh, you saw the King Vision laryngoscope. You saw the compression system that we did for all the training. Again, we, we bring OSHA up because it's, such a, it's becoming such a critical part of EMS operations where uh, you, you have to stay compliant at all times. We upgraded the EMS protocols with the Emory system. We also have a relationship with Wellstar. Uh, Dr. John Knox is our guy that's basically boots on the ground. He, he works out of Pauline here. And if there are any issues, John is the first one to jump on it to make sure that things are taken care of and the right level of care. We worked very heavily on patient documentation training. And you may ask, why, why is that such a big deal? Well, it, it is because it, it, it's uh, the way that Medicare is going nowadays and insurance companies, if, if our paperwork isn't done correctly, they're going to roll it back to the citizen. So it's very important that we, we do all, all our work right. And then on the customer service, we want to make sure that we're, we're good with you with the, with the level of patient care, but at the same time, we deliver optimum customer service. So those have been our, our, our pieces. We uh, unfortunately have had a couple of disasters with the snow that we've had up here uh, and, and some of the other things, but it's been handled real well. We're very pleased with, with working with the fire department chief. Your folks have just done a, an outstanding job. We're honored to be working with you side by side. Um, I don't know of really of any incident that uh, with the snow or any of the other things that, have, that has gone on. We did lose one ambulance uh, in an accident. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time and got run into, but luckily there was nothing wrong. That's another piece of the Mercedes. It's a very safe vehicle, um, and it, it's just a, a real tribute to the engineering that they've been able to perform. Some of our special operations, in case you see them around, uh, we do a lot of special events uh, around town. We'll, we'll be more than happy to do some of the, we're doing high school, but some of the other things you'll see is uh, church events, charity events, uh, any kind of festival that would be going on in either one of the cities. And uh, we uh, basically will do a, a new concept, which we started in Cobb, and I'm not sure how we are here in Paulding, but we call it a medic in a bag. A lot of the school systems were having issues raising funds because of the ambulance expense, not just here in, in, in Paulding, but anywhere else in, in the city were having issues with just how much it costs. So we came up, we asked permission, well, if we had a paramedic with with all the equipment, a paramedic, no vehicle, radios, etc., could they stabilize the patient and at that same time reduce the expense substantially? So we were able to bring the price down from over $400, which is the contracted rate, for example, in Cobb, I think in Fulton it's five something per game, down to under $100 per game. So it was, it was the right thing to do. It was a win-win for everybody. And we're hoping that gets implemented out here too. I know you can't see it, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but we, uh, we track all the responses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't see it. So uh, we, we track all the responses. And I mentioned earlier Zoll. 
And this is the results of Zoll. We're able to pull reports like this, and I'll, I'll read it to you real quickly. Um, this data is from the, from the 1st of uh, January through July. And we, resp we have responded to 5,827 calls for service. Uh, out of that, we've trans we have uh, made patient interaction 5,173 times. We have had an average response time of 7.8 minutes. The cardiac arrest, uh, this is a very interesting fact. We have uh, responded on 41. Of those 41, we monitor how many times the Lucas device that you saw was utilized. It was 28 times. There are some factors that, that prevent us from using it from time to time, but uh, overall the percentages are pretty good. We're able to use that for our reporting. We performed uh, community services 19 times. We had 12 unseen standbys. We had uh, eight police standbys, and we had 39 other events that we, we were with. Some of the interesting demographics that you'll see is that uh, the average age for the, the, the next slide. yeah, you're right. We're gonna, we're gonna break it down here. Well, most popular transport that, that we have are accidents, automobile accidents, as you can imagine. The next being sick, the third being uh, breathing problems, and latter is being is falls. So those are those are the, those are the main five categories. I won't go over this whole thing with you, but uh, it's a, it's a very interesting report as far as to see what kind of calls we go on. We also document the streets where things occur. Uh, we know that over 50% of the calls are to people 55 years of age and older. And of that 55%, 3,033 were female and 2,100 were male. So there's a breakdown, uh, a little bit of the demographics of how, of the age and the folks when we transport. And that is where the accidents occur. <laughs> so we document on a map uh, where accidents occur on the street. So it kind of gives you a reading. If, if you're able to utilize it to modify the time it takes to change a red light or things of that nature, it's, it's there, we, we provide it. And uh, it's very interesting for us because it enables us to decide where we put ambulances at what time of day, because we know based on this, there's a history, there's a pattern of where accidents occur. So we're moving ambulances constantly around to meet this demand and at the same time, by doing so, we reduce the amount of time, of course, the takes us to get there. So that's uh, essentially where we are, and we're very happy with our partnership, of course, with Wellstar, and look forward to continuing uh, our relationship with them. Any questions? Uh, Pete, thank you very much. I, I think that's done. Uh, Without any kind of county supplement, so yes, there's no subsidy. We we, we, we use nothing but user fees. Okay. And Pete, thanks for being here. I wanted to stay. Here. Yes, sir. I want to know how much an ambulance fully configured cost. Um, <clears throat> right now it's running right around 170 thousand. That's what those Mercedes fully equipped were with all the equipment. Um, it's 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 about the same as as when it was. Ford, the Ford itself was more expensive vehicle per vehicle than the Mercedes, but because we have more equipment now in the Mercedes, the, the total price has gone up somewhat. The Lucas device, for example, those are around thirteen thousand dollars a piece. How many ambulances do we have in the county during the day and during the evenings? Uh, it Roughly, doesn't really fluctuate too much. Right now, you have anywhere between six to eight. Uh, there are times when you have when it gets very busy and we roll resources in from COP and you may have as many as 10 or 11. Our, our goal is to start putting on that and we have a station that we can utilize for deployment by the hospital which makes things very well for us logistically. You're going to see a lot more of the 12 hour variety. We're still going to have them around the clock but this will be a way to enhance the, the response and the performance that we deliver. Thank you. Any other questions? 
good report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark, do you and Devin either one want to add anything to that? Thank you. No bid awards, uh, no reports from committees and departments. Uh, public participation on agenda items. Then sign up not, not come. Oh, oh I'm sorry. My name is Len Black I live at 3 Indian Lake Court in Cairo, and I'd like to bring up a point under new business discussion item 6, that the Cobb County Tax Commission is going to retain 3.5% of the fees of collecting school taxes. Now, we are spending millions of dollars on our airport, millions of dollars on industrial parks, millions of dollars in county improvements to bring about a change in the environment within Cobb County, I mean within uh, Paulding County. Some statistics. Paulding County ranks number 59 of all the school systems within the state of Georgia. That is the lower two-thirds. Of our high school graduates by the age of 25, only 23 percent get a continuing education degree where the state average is 29.8%. Paulding County lacks significantly behind our surrounding counties in techno technology advancements. I feel that the county taking extra money from the school system is taking away from the future of our county and that the money that we will collect could be better used for our students than other purposes within the county. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the consent agenda item discuss actions on two consent agenda items. Uh, number one, amend the June 24, 2014 board meeting minutes. There's nothing new that we're doing here. We're just mm -hmm. adopting a change in the minutes because it was a, a uh, typo. Change order for modification of slope drainage structure within the runway 31 safety overrun project at the Paul Northwest Atlanta Airport as submitted by Plateau Excavation in the amount of $136,182.93 to reflect the <coughs> amount actually adopted by the Board of Commissioners change order for modification of slopes and drainage structures within the runway 31 safety overrun project at the Paul Northwest Airport as submitted by Plateau Excavation in the amount of $176,856.60. Number two, recommend the Board of Commissioners approve the revision of the alcohol, beverage license, and permit schedule on the effective date of August 12, 2014. Would you like to move either one of these two items for regular session? I do have a question. Uh, on the alcohol license, there was the only change was in the license where it combined the uh, <coughs> there was no fee changes or anything, correct? That, that's correct. It was just merging the uh, resident alcohol catering license with the on-premise license. So it wasn't an increase in the fee. We just merged those licenses together. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, no old business. Under new business, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-18 setting millage rates for the county tabitha good morning good morning, good morning. Good morning. Um, as you know a few weeks ago we advertised our 503 street which for the first time in oh well last year we had a small increase in our digest this year we did have an increase in our digest and we have opted to roll the millage rate back um, the 2013 rate was 8.22, and the 2014 rate will be seven, or is proposed at 7.267 mills. That is the amount to collect the same thing for the exact same amount for the assessments as the assessments were last year. We'll collect no more taxes um, 
for the property that was there. So unless you have any questions. Okay. Number three, discuss action adopt resolution 14-20 setting millage rates for the county bond. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, no, excuse me. Number two, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-19 setting millage rates for the fire ditch. Same thing. We are proposing um, that we leave the millage rate alone because our, our fire department is continues to grow. So our millage rate for 2013 was 3.1 meals and our millage rate for 2014 was 3.1 meals according to this resolution. Any discussion? Okay. That was the, uh, that particular fire tax was one that the voters, I just want to make a note, the voters did vote on that to go anywhere from two to five meals that's, in that's order correct. to fund and support and grow our fire department. That's correct. Number three, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-20 setting millage rates for the county bond. The uh, county bond millage rate is set in 2013 at 2.2 .2 mills and we're proposing the exact same millage rate that um, it will generate approximately six and a half million dollars to pay the debt that um, currently exists within the county. Any questions? Number four, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-21 setting millage rates for the Pauling County School District. As you know, uh, Board of Commissioners, we are the, you are the tax, um, it's, you, you do establish the taxes for the county, so the school board actually goes through their public, their own public hearings and then they um, request what the millage rate should be to you. We've received a letter and they're leaving their millage rate the same. It was 18.879 mills. In 2013, and they're proposing a further requesting 18.879 meals again in 2014. Any discussion? Okay, number five, discuss action to adopt resolution 14 22 setting millage rate for the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia is reducing their millage rate by five hundredths of a meal each year to get to zero. So um, in 2013, it was 0.15 mills in 2014. It um, is 0.1 mills. That's requested by state law. Like next year, it'll be 0.05, and then they'll go to zero. Any discussion? Number six, discuss action to adopt resolution 14 23 authorizing the tax commissioner to retain a 2.5% fee for collecting school tax. Um, as you know, the, the Tax commissioner does send out tax notices. Um, this cost goes to offset some of the costs in our uh, tax assessor's office as well as the collections in the tax commissioner's office. And it has, we've uh, collected two and a half percent in the past. And so this is just a continuing the same, same process. And this is a common practice in most areas because again, it, it pays for the function of the tax commissioner. That's correct. And, and it is less expensive off. for them to be able, I mean, they couldn't do their own. So it makes more sense to include them. And it's easier for the citizens as well to get one bill instead of a bill from each entity. Any other questions? Number seven, discuss action to adopt the budget for the fiscal year 2015. Um, as you know, at the last meeting, we had a um, public hearing regarding the budget. And since that time, we've made a few changes, and I'll go over a few of those with you. The library budget was reduced by 33,000 because we did receive a grant, so that there will be $120,000 in books purchased um, for, the, for the four libraries. The airport budget, it was mentioned that um, we had exceeded the budget in 2014, so that amount was increased by 100,000. Um, the sheriff's budget, the school board agreed to reinstate uh, four officers within the school system's budget, so they'll be paying for four additional officers to be at those schools for nine months of the year, which will allow us to hire three additional officers. The, and the, the difference in the three and four, they only pay nine months out of the year. That's and correct. And you'll have enough money to hire actual three. That's correct. That's correct. Um, and the cost and the cost and the revenue for those are expected to balance out. 
the animal control budget, it was increased by 123,000. Um, this increase came as a result of staff's recommendations to enhance the spay neuter program um, and to increase the um, adoption. What we hope to do, we um, hope to start this process and see how it goes and um, for the different change, for all of the changes that have been uh, recommended. The marshals, we, the, you know, there was a question as to whether or not they should have three positions or two. They will only have two. It will be for the courthouse security here in this building or for admin security. The third, we did not remove the funding because those two positions um, are requiring some additional, or that requiring some additional time, as well as some of those funds will be used in the animal control budget to be able to um, better enhance that project. Does that make sense? And in the non-departmental, we reduced the other professional fees to an amount that um, is expected. And the Richland Creek Reservoir would reduce that by about by $50,000. Those um, are in anticipation of us receiving a permit. And then we will, um, as you know, we've been awarded GIFA loans and we will begin construction, which will be funding of a different sort, source rather than um, this general fund. Um, revenues, I've gone back through. Um, those are sometimes difficult because you have fines and fees that are coming from the courts. You have um, charges for services, and those vary from year to year. But I went back through what we actually finished 2014 with and increased um, some of our revenues because I don't think that they'll be reduced, that they'll come down any. I think those will be continued. So those are basically the changes that we have incorporated into this budget. In the back, I added um, an additional section of notes that was just for reference only. We're not really taking action on these, but it was requested at the public hearing, which is the IBA's budget. It's a draft budget. It's not approved. Um, it's not balanced on this sheet. It's just to give an idea of where the $275,000 of our contribution goes. And then we have the water sewer system um, budget request, which is for additional personnel and for the equipment. The water sewer system is a little bit different because they're an enterprise system and it's a flexible budget. So if they don't have the revenues, they don't generate the revenues, they can't incur the expense. Um, we have to balance that budget as well. They have to show an income of greater than um, 110% of their debt amount to be able to to be able to make these purchases or add this additional of their side. debt payments of their debt payments annual debt payments. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that since the last meeting, um, as you know, the airport bonds did close. We did receive those funds. So I do have, uh, we have been reimbursed from the airport authority for the expenses um, incurred in that contract, which I had presented to you an assumption that I would not have those funds for the end of the year, but it will be a receivable, and because we received it August, um, the check was stated August 1st. You will end the year, you, we should end the year, and we're still going through this process, but we should end the year without using fund balance in 2014. And we had originally budgeted a 1.9 use of fund balance, and then I presented to you over the past couple of months that we've probably used $2 million worth of fund balance. And now I can tell you due to this reimbursement and some other things that have come in, it looks like we'll break even. So give or take a little bit, but we should, um, in the, fund, in the year, so it makes me feel better about using as much of our fund balance, which has been topic of discussion through this process. Um, we're using $3.7 million of fund balance, which is still a lot, can't do that year to year, but 
um, it does make me feel better to know. Just for a point of reference, um, 2013, we ended the year at $28 million in um, fund balance, and which works out to be about 47% of our expenses. And we will, after we use this, we'll go down about 41% is what we use it. What we should have, if everything goes according to the budget, in 2015, we'll end the year at 41%. So, helps my feelings, um, and I thought it would be interesting to you to have that information. We, we um, try to make sure that we have on hand a rainy day fund of 25 That is the bare and, minimum. And, and we have kept 33, but now we will end the year, you said, at 41. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, you want to add anything to what Tabitha is? Um, I, I guess just uh, the only thing I would add is just to clarify. I, I walked through this with, with Tabitha. So when your budget, Mr. Chairman, was prepared and released to the public on June 1st, the assumption in that budget was that there would be $26 million of available fund balance. Now there will be $28 million worth of available fund balance. So if you move forward with the budget that you have today that's now presented to the full board with these changes that Tabitha has discussed, you'll be starting that budget $2 million ahead of where you thought you were going to be starting, which as, you, as the point you made there is if your budget, if you use all of the fund balance that you propose to use, um, you will end the year with about $24.3 million of fund balance, or 41%, well in excess of uh, not only the minimum, but uh, the recommended any questions? We'd like to say that uh, although there's maybe things in the budget we don't all agree with, I'd like to thank Mike and Tabitha for their work the department heads because they worked hard and went back and forth. And I sent them both an email this week to express that. And, uh, so although we may not always agree on where everything's being spent, I know the efforts that you guys have worked hard. Mike, I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate the presentation that you gave three weeks ago. I had quite a few citizens that complimented on that. And so I'd like to thank you for that, Tabitha, for your efforts, because I know you're the backbone behind that. And uh, just to let you know that I appreciate that. Uh, there was one other thing we're, we're going on to the next one. When you get ready. Okay. Um, the only, the only question that I had over everything you discussed, and I, and I don't want it to be a hardcore discussion, mm -hmm. but raising that 100000 on the airport budget, that was kind of Mr. Graham's thing because we knew, we've all known that uh, what was spent this year, we knew next year that what we were budgeting was not going to be enough for it. But I think the other part of his question was, if that went over, whether or not we were going to continue to fund that out of general fund. And so I had never gotten a clear answer on that. Are we given that 400000 and then that's going to be it? Or are we just given the 400000 and then more we're going to do more? To, to clarify what, what my statement was and what's here, they're two different things. My, I did recognize that, you know, you know that's not enough. You got to have at least one hundred. But what I proposed was to eliminate the airport department and fund the airport authority, just like you fund the IBA. But what you have in this budget is you're keeping the airport authority and you're funding them like any other department. So you know, if anything above your budget, you still got to approve uh, as long as it's below fifty thousand uh, dollars. So no, it's not. What's here is not exactly what I propose. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, you know, if I had answered that, uh, bearing any unforeseen circumstances, we, we certainly will have a crystal ball to see, but hopefully that is the budget. I guess my only uh, comment would be, and I don't at all to mean this to be negative, if they don't occur, having that extra expense, and it's not needed, then we just give the airport 
that much more money. No. We, this, is, this is a department. This is not like the idea. You don't write them a check. This is a department of the county just like DOT is a department of the county. And we control those expenses. You're not writing a check to the airport department for this. this is, we're still maintaining a department. Uh, airport director actually, or the department head of the airport authority actually operates the airport and actually answers and works for the airport authority also. I mean, it's keeping it all the same, it just increased your internal department budget. But that, that money can be used for whatever they choose to use for if they're budget, I assume. No, no, it's, 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 it's the, Tommy said it's, it's the same as any other department in the county, with animal control or libraries. The, the, the budget itself is a, is a guide, it's what our right. anticipated expenses are. But if their expenses are $380,000, then $20,000 simply returns to the general fund. Um, if their expenses are 500000 it's because y'all voted to give them another $100,000 at some point during the year to fund some project. So the, the 400000 is simply a budget, just like DOT or any other any other budget. So if their expenses go over, y'all have a hand in that because three of y'all said it should. I got to brag on the sheriff. He's returned money uh, to us, I believe, every year. Yeah, same, same as the sheriff's budget. The dollars that he gets at the end of the year, if he hasn't expended those dollars, those, those funds are simply returned back to general fund. Number eight, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-24, amending a moratorium on the acceptance of rezoning applications for all sewer developments within the Sweetwater drainage basin. And, uh, Good morning. Good morning. Um, this was an agenda item that we discussed at the last commission meeting. This deals with a moratorium that was adopted in February of 2007 that um, limited any residential rezoning requests requiring sewer for properties within unincorporated Paulding County within the Sweetwater drainage basin. Um, that was put in place, like I mentioned, in 2007 for 12 months or until both Pauling County and Cobb County have completed the necessary engineering for a Cobb Pauling sewer line. Um, the 12 months has definitely passed and as we stand right now, there are no engineering or acquisition of easements on the Pauling County side. However, the county owns and operates the Sweetwater Creek Wastewater Reclamation Facility, which has a designated service area that has ample capacity to serve that area. So based on the sufficient supply of capacity, it's recommended to change that moratorium to exclude the area served by the Sweetwater Creek water, wastewater reclamation facility. I think that that plant currently is at, uh, operating at 10 or 15 percent of capacity. 10 percent. 10 percent. Okay. In looking at your map, is there a portion of this is for the lines get funny. I guess that's Carroll County. Is there a portion that we service that our can service similar to what we do in the north end of the county that we service in Carroll County? We don't presently have any sort of intergovernmental agreement that will allow that, but uh, in terms of the, geo the topography out there, yeah. So that's, that's what this little line at the bottom. I mean, it shows an area that would fall into that. Um, I'm not sure what those lines are for. Uh, I think those are actually streets, um, or unimproved streets. Um, but, okay. but to answer your question, yes, there is some uh, land area uh, of, of Carroll that could, that could reach this plant, but we don't presently have any sort of agreement to allow it. Any other discussion? Thank you. Number nine, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-25 identifying real property proposed for conveyance to the state for the purpose of constructing a new customer service center of the Georgia Department of Driver Safety. Chuck Rand. Commissioner, I spoke with uh, Mr. Rand. I'll handle uh, just very briefly on this resolution. Uh, as you all are aware, there's going to be a DDS customer service center uh, in Balding that we brought up on previous agendas. All this resolution does is basically designate with a legal description the acreage that is going to be conveyed to the state for the purposes of the customer service center. Uh, the resolution indicates that we're going to give it to the state. However, if the state fails to operate the facility or fails to construct it, then we by deed will have a first right of refusal to go back and reacquire the property to the county 
Uh, the only issue that will come up requiring the county to pay any money for that is in the event that the state has actually made any improvements to the property, the purchase price would be the fair market value of those improvements. The resolution also has a provision in it that states that uh, the county will provide public road access to the facility. I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have, or Mr. Rand may. So the uh, I know that of course the public we got to improve the street, and then we're actually doing the sign. So if for some reason they were to cease having a DDS there, we would only according to the D, we wouldn't have to pay them back for a pad ready side we just or any of the improvements we did providing sewer to it or anything it's strictly what they spent on the facility correct okay. the, the idea is being we're doing that we get it back we shouldn't have to pay for that okay. uh, again i can't tell you the number of hours that chuck Rand's worked on this so chuck thank you for a great amount of work on this and of course the georgia state patrol unit going in the uh, water system. Uh, we were the largest uh, populated county without a driver uh, services. So I know uh, Charlie Watts uh, and uh, Howard Maxwell worked very hard to make this happen. So I'm extremely happy about that. Mr. Chairman, if I can add, just, just for clarification for the public, back in the day when a lot of us got our driver's licenses uh, initially, we got them from what we, what we all refer to as the state patrol. State Patrol used to, uh, you know, they drive trooper cars, and they used to be in the business of issuing driver's licenses. That is no longer the case. There are two separate state government departments that do that. The Department of Public Safety operates the State Patrol. We'll be getting a State Patrol post over at the uh, over at the water system building. The Department of Driver Services they issue driver's licenses. Uh, they will be building the facility here on this campus solely for the purpose of driver's license related issues. Two separate departments, they've split up what used to be combined. Uh, number 10, discuss action to adopt resolution 14-26, authorizing a voter referendum on whether to allow package sales on Sunday by retailers, a package mall beverages, and <coughs> Mike, you wanna make a comment on this? I, I will. And, uh, County Attorney making a comment on this. I guess first let me start by reading what the ballot question would actually say. Uh, the ballot question will read, shall the governing authority of Paulding County be authorized to permit and regulate package sales by retailers of malt beverages and wine on Sundays between the hours of 12.30 and 11.30 and p.m.? So that, and, and your option is to vote yes or vote no. That's so this is what the ballot question would say. What is before you is not whether or not you agree that malt beverage and package sales ought to occur, it's whether or not you agree that the public ought to have the option to decide for themselves. So we discussed this about two years ago, it was nearly two years ago uh, this month. Um, that was, you, the Board of Commissioners uh, voted to allow that to go forward on a special election which occurred on March 19th of 2013. Uh, just slightly over 2% of the registered voters turned out for that vote. Uh, it was turned down. Um, I'm satisfied you had as many calls as I had about the interest in having that question brought back up during a general election. As you know, we have a general election that's scheduled for Tuesday, November 4th of this year. There's no cost associated with placing this on the ballot should you choose to do so. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, just to clarify one item, uh, when we deal with alcohol at the state or county level, we deal with really three kinds of alcohol. Uh, we deal with beer, wine, and distilled spirits. This is only for wine and beer. This does not cover distilled spirits. Uh, Pauline County is not a county that uh, presently at the time can legally be in the business of regulating distilled spirits. They're not uh, sold in the county. So this is beer and wine only. Any other discussion? Uh, number 11, discuss an enhanced security upgrade project for the Silver Comet Trail with a not to exceed uh, project budget of 
$275,000 using recreational splashed funds. Uh, Mike, I believe, uh, it was a group of us that met, uh, you, uh, Michael Justice with Parson Recreation, Sheriff Gullidge, uh, Quinn, uh, is it Lieutenant? Corporal uh, Quinn, who is primarily responsible for the Silver Comet Trail. Uh, we, we've been looking at this for quite a while uh, to make upgrades to digitize those cameras and get a better image uh, of that park. Uh, I call Carolyn Delamont and there's several million people that visit uh, the Silver Comet Trail and are visitors to Paulin every year. So uh, I think we need to do as much as we can to bring uh, security up. Uh, we had a lady that was attacked. Uh, we have some leads, the Sheriff's Department is working on those leads, but uh, if we can do more to bring safety to this area, uh, th this is something that you can use splashed funds for. Uh, also, uh, in the meeting, who else do we have that was in attendance? Uh, our IT director, uh, Will Lyons, was present, uh, Chuck Graham was present, and then when we went out on the field, uh, David Reno joined us, who was also one of the patrol officers. You want to talk about exactly? Uh, uh, certainly. Um, what we did is uh, after we after we initially met, we laid out the 18-mile section of the trail and evaluated where utilities are present. Particularly, fiber was the most important, and secondary to that was the power. Um, and there was a seven-mile section of trail, which also coincided with the most heavily used section of trail. We currently have uh, three um, trailheads that have, are equipped with cameras today. Uh, we want to increase the camera locations from three locations to 21 locations. And we want to upgrade the cameras that are there to um, high resolution digital. And, and we're gonna put about 47 of them out on the trail. This is all part of uh, what we refer to as phase one. The trail itself is about 18 miles through Pauley County. This will take care of about seven miles of it. We want to do this quickly. We'd like to have this uh, operational in the next 60 days. Uh, to accomplish that, we've prepared a budget. Um, again, as the chairman pointed out, these are recreational swaps dollars that will be used to, uh, to uh, enhance the security on the trail. Uh, we're requesting uh, an operational budget of $275,000 to implement phase one. Um, uh, should that be approved, we'll come back to you for phase two. It is a rough, rough budget, but we're looking phase two is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $400,000. We'll know more when we do phase one and give you a better number, but phase two is several months down the road. Uh, phase two would allow the installation um, of additional fiber on, along the trail, about five miles, um, seven new camera locations uh, total. So we're gonna extend the phase one to the east two miles towards the Cobb County line and to the west, three miles towards uh, Mount Olive Road. So, so that's kind of an overview of the, the entire project. Um, the IT department has worked this week uh, to prepare a drawing of what that's going to look like, and I would invite you at the end of this, this work session to come take a look at that. It's, a, it's an aerial photo that specifically shows the locations. Um, those locations may change when we get out in the field. Again, uh, some of that's gonna be predicated on access to power. Uh, Chuck Rand, our community development, our uh, government services director, is currently working with power companies on uh, cost and access for power to those cameras. Um, the sheriff may have additional comments uh, he would like to make uh, on the project. Uh, I'll leave those to him. Yeah. <clears throat> this is for the cameras only. This, this does not include the additional smart cars, that kind of thing. This, this number is for the cameras only. That's correct. $275,000 is, is the camera hardware and installation to make those cameras operational. Okay. Now, to get it up and going in 60 days, will you go through a normal bid process and can you, I mean? That's a very good question. I, I Personally, I, I, I don't want to do that. I think that, that not that we don't want to, to have competitive bidding, but I hope that there is a route that would limit the amount of time but also accomplish the competitive bidding process of that. I don't know how to answer that question yet. I, I can't give you a straight answer. Right. And, and I guess the other question is, will there be a con, I mean, let's just say XYZ company says, yeah, we'll put them all in for $275,000. Will there be a contract that you will need us to approve? Or is this actually 
giving y'all the authority to do this? What, what we prefer is this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we would like for you to authorize the chairman to enter into a contract for up to $275,000 to keep this from having to come back. Now, phase two, we'll have a lot more time to work with, but phase one, we'd like to implement right away. Um, we're still going to struggle with, with the bidding part of that. It may be that we end up having to bid it, but the, the idea is, is to reduce that time as much as possible. I mean, you may do a request, uh, a, a bid by invitation. Correct. That's, that's of one option. Posting. That's one option. Uh, we've actually explored purchasing, specking the hardware, the switches, and the cameras themselves purchasing those and then hiring out the labor uh, and, and, and taxing them with installing the equipment that we purchased ourselves. So I, I just don't know yet. I just want to make sure, how, I mean, how are you going to accomplish it in 60 days? Are, are any of these uh, cameras on uh, state contract? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the cameras that we're looking at are very similar to the ones that we placed in uh, uh, Veterans Park here at the government complex. That's a familiarity with them. Mike or Sheriff, can you speak to how to monitor or if they are monitored? Yeah, uh, that's another unknown. Uh, they can be. Uh, we we are able to pull up the cameras that are in Veterans Park today. So there, there's a way to log in from uh, an iPad or a laptop and actually take a look at those cameras. You simply have to know which camera you want and you can pull them up and monitor them. <coughs> the initial thought was let's have these cameras monitored in places where we have security in place, whether that's a 911 or the existing courthouse. Uh, the sheriff has his own ideas on where that's going to go. We fully support that. The capability is there to have the monitor. I don't believe, unless the sheriff is going to contradict me, that the, that the idea is that they're going to be monitored 24 hours a day. That is not the goal of these, of these cameras at all. Um, but certainly the, the, um, the ability to monitor them exists. Have you looked at maybe monitor anything in the smart cars that yeah. That's what I told them with Shard is. I said, we can get laptops and the smart cars that they yeah. is actually out there, can pull them up on their laptops, and they can back away. And, I mean, why well, we got them come out there because they know the where we had trouble at. They can back away from those and use the cameras to get eyes down the trail. Uh, a lot of people think and they don't use the trail, thinks this is something new with Shard. We've been working that trail for ever since I've been to Sheriff. I've had three digits assigned to that trail. It's probably the most patrol road in the county. It's 18 miles and I have three dickies and that's all they do is work that trail. I've got a lot of, I won't say criticism, but a lot of people that's making, giving me advice. You know, the cars are no good, you need to put bicycles out there. You know, the cars ain't any good, you need to get out there on golf carts. We have bicycles that we use some, but if you're at the Hiram Trailhead and there's a problem at the tunnel, and it's 18 miles away from you, and you're on a, on a 14 mile an hour vehicle, you don't want to be over there waiting on us to get there. That's, that's where I originally come up with this idea for the cars. Of course, you don't want to go flying down the trail, but with a car that's licensed, you can get out on 278, which runs parallel with the trail, and you can bypass all the people, and you don't have to run them off the road and make everybody mad at you, and then get back on the trail where the problem is. Uh, the additional cars will help. Uh, we have two out there right now. I think the cameras will help. I don't know that you can say that once the cameras are up, it's going to be a safe place to be, but I think people are like kids. They, they act better when they know they're being watched. So as long as there's a chance, and it, it will not stop people from coming in from different uh, places, but if they access the trail, uh, even back to this lady, we could at least have a time frame of where she got on, where she went. We could also have a time frame of anybody else that we looking at. Did they come on at the trail? Did they come on to the chamber? Or did they come out of the trails out of the woods? I don't know. Some people's never been out there. There's all kinds of side trails coming out of these apartment complexes, out of trailer parks, out of the housing projects. Uh, there's trails coming out of subdivisions that's along the trail. There's all kind of places, and uh, Mike Quinn works out there day in and day out, and that's why we took him with us. And he said, this is a place where we've worked a lot. This is a place where we've had a lot of trouble. And those places, we've had to find putting up some of these cameras. Uh, I told Mike I have no issue if they want to put the monitors in the courthouse. We have a, basically a mini jail in the basement of the courthouse. There's a deputy there as long as the courthouse is open. They can monitor them. They can put them in our control room at the jail. It's man 24-7. Uh, but the deputies in the cars, if they can pull them up on their laptops, I think it would be a grand thing for them to be out there and be able to see that the trail. No matter where they're sitting, they can skip all places down the trail and watch. And I think you can identify problems before they start. You can identify people that don't naturally belong out there. If you go out there like we're dressed, you're going to get some funny looks. If you go out there and run the shorts, or you go out there in biking clothes, 
nobody really pays you attention. So, you know, they get on these cameras and they see somebody don't fit in, they can get to it pretty quick. Um, I, I, I know you've been asked this before, and I, I, I think I know the answer, but do you have any update on the investigation? Uh, nothing that I would talk about right now. Uh, there's a lot going on with it. We're chasing down, we're chasing every lead we can get. We're talking this, we got so much going on, it's probably not a public comment that I would make. We're chasing down everything we look at. Uh, looking down every road there is. Uh, the bad part is, is right now nobody's seen anything, nobody heard anything, and that's where we're at. Uh, the media's driving a lot of people. Like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rides and benefits going on to make that money for this lady. I started a reward fund that if somebody could give us information on the arrest and prosecution of this person, uh, that fund yesterday again was about $23,000. So if anybody has any information regarding what happened on the trail, if they'll call 770-443-3015 and ask for any investigator there, we'll be glad to talk to you. We're, we're getting inundated with tips, and of course you have to chase them all down, and it's just time to the work. We'll put that number uh, on this uh, video. But if somebody wanted to contribute to that fund, how would they go about doing that? Uh, the Bank of North Georgia over off Major Mont Road. Uh, I talked to the manager there and she set up an account. I talked to Jason before we done it. There's three different ways you can do it. There's a form when you come out. I had a lot of people and I didn't understand why that they wanted to make donations to it, but they wanted to remain anonymous. And I thought, why would they do that? And the lady that called me, she said, well, I want to put some money in the account, but if something happens, I don't want anybody to come after me or my family for trying to help catch them. I said, okay, I understand it. So we set up a form. You can come in and make an anonymous donation. There's three boxes on it. If you want your money returned after, well, I think we set a two-year deadline on it, if nothing's been done with the money, or if law enforcement catches them without the help of this fund. If, like a business donates it, they say, okay, if you, if you do that, we want our money back. I have a form and I'll send you your money back as soon as it's over with. There's also a box on there you can check that I don't want my money back. I want this money to go used for security for the trail. We can buy stuff for the trail for added security. And I thought I'll give them another way to do it. It's our calls for kids program. If you don't want your money back, you can check that box. And whichever you prefer to do with money, you will either return it or put it in one of those two accounts. Any questions? Uh, or? One more thing, if you don't mind. I've had a lot of people ask me about some smart cars. Uh, most people think it's a good idea. I took one myself and went out on the trail, and I interacted with people out there to make sure that they didn't have an issue with it. Uh, I, I didn't want to go out there and those people out there on that trail, they own that place. We bought a street and trail bike one time, and I myself went out there and rode it. I got stopped three times and got cussed out for riding a motorcycle on the trail until they figured out who I was. And I said, you know, we're trying to use this thing. They didn't like the smart cars we went out there. You can use right up behind people. They're quiet. Nobody really knows you're coming through. They don't bother anybody. Everybody out there on the trail are used to our cars. Mike was with me. I had two different bicycles come up and thank us for being out there. He said, I ride the trail from Cobb, Pauly, and Polk all the time. He said, that every time I come through here, I see your guys. Uh, a lot of people are saying that we shouldn't be buying the cars. We should be using them like the little Kawasaki mules we used to have. They're about the same price, and we was wearing two of those mules out a year. As Tim Ash and Fleet Mank said, these things are not designed for what y'all are doing. We're running back and forth up down the trail, and top speed was like 14 miles an hour. So we bought the cars for about the same price, and Mike asked me, he said, well, how long are these cars going to last? I said, I don't know yet. We're still running. Uh, you know, everybody says well, we're a kid. Well, so and so can't get them. Me and Mike Jones got him one and rode around. And I told Mike, I said, you get out on four lane, you run 65 mile an hour. He said, I don't go that fast in that car. So we're going down the road. And I said, Mike, I didn't think you want to go 65. And he's like, gee, this thing's pretty nice. Shoulders don't touch. There's plenty of room in them. We've got cameras in them, just like the police cars. There's lights on them. Uh, and they are looking to look at. Unlike you. Unlike me. Yeah. Okay. I have a place for radio. Yeah. I have a question about Ms. Waddell. Uh, is she stable enough to be able to tell her story yet? Or, or I, I won't go to the doctor part. She hasn't told us her story yet. Can I ask one thing, Mike? There's 275000 since we're so pushed to get this done. Is that enough? Or do, we, do, you, do you need more of a buffer? Um, I think that's okay. I think we can get it done with that. Um, we we had about a 15% contingency to what we thought the actual dollar amount would be based on our experience with the installation in Veterans Park. I appreciate that, um, but I, I think the 275 will, will get us. Um, if we do bid this out and it comes in higher than that, um, 
I intend to move forward with $275,000 worth of stuff, and I will come back to you immediately and, and ask for additional financial assistance. But I think we'll be okay. The yellow on that, also, I'd like to thank Chuck Green and Mike Jones and Will Lyons. They spent a lot of time with us out there. And, uh, I've never come to them with a problem that they don't drop what they're doing and come to help me. I appreciate y'all guys for that. Uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, and I've always been that way, but I've never come to them with a problem that they don't actually drop what they're doing and get in the middle of it. Uh, great guys to work with, uh, very knowledgeable, lots of experience. Uh, I'm proud to be co workers with them. And for recreational sponsored funds, uh, this capital expense that this is exactly usual. Yes, sir. Correct. Another thing I'd like to say, y'all don't mind, I'm going to keep on talking. The three cameras we have out there, and now it's not really anything to say about it at the time they split up the analog cameras. Uh, we have people in here who got a lot of business with cameras. The analog cameras are basically useless. You can see people go by, but if David Barnett come walking by the trail in the daytime and was you can look at the thing and say, well, it's a tall white guy. But you can't look at the, track that, that the film we've got from it and say, well, that's David Barnett. So these digital cameras will change that when he comes by, so that's David Barnett wearing glasses. Uh, the digital cameras have improved technology so much. Uh, and I think it'll also give us eyes on the trail at night when we're having problems. We know where the problems are. We had a lot of people using the trail at night when they're not even supposed to be out there. So now we, you know, from my home, I can get on the computer and look at these cameras, I think it'd be a great safety asset. Because they go infrared. Do what? They're infrared uh, cameras for night vision. Yeah, they, they'll switch over when the, when the lighting drops, they'll switch over to a black and white image, but the black and white image is incredibly sharp, so it, it doesn't take very much light, even full darkness, to be able to see what's going on out there. And really, it matters, we just like, we need to see that there's actually people moving on there and where they're moving at, and we can intercept Thank you, Sheriff. Thank any, you. any other questions? Thank you, Officer. Y'all supported. That's the conclusion of a regular business session. There's no executive uh, session. Uh, we do have Bill Gersky uh, wishing to speak. If you'll come to the lecture, uh, you have five minutes, and you're going to talk about uh, Sunday alcohol sales. Yes, yeah, Sunday alcohol sales. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, before Mr. Gersky begins. Previously, I made a comment about this business item. I want to just clarify one thing before I get a phone call. I uh, indicated that the county does not regulate distilled spirits. We don't regulate distilled spirits when it comes to package sales. We do regulate distilled spirits when it comes to liquor by the drink. Just want to make that clarification for someone called me and told me I was wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was here recently. Uh, my name is Bill Gersky. My family owns and operates Crossroads Grocery in Holden County for over 15 years. And, uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to come back again. Um, I came back today because today is uh, a very special day. Uh, this afternoon, the, uh, the commissioners will vote on whether they'll allow the uh, agenda to have Sunday alcohol sales in November election. Um, Half of what I was going to say, uh, Mike Jones covered very well, so uh, I'll be even briefer than I was going to be. Uh, as he mentioned, we're not voting on whether we're going to have it or not, but we're voting on giving the residents an opportunity to voice their opinion, and that's all they want. Um, I've talked to a lot of people in the county who merely want an opportunity to vote on whether they want it or not. Uh, I took the liberty to uh, have a petition signed by over eight or almost 800 people uh, in which they signed a petition not saying they want it, but they like the opportunity. Um, as was mentioned by Mike last year in the special election, uh, 80, excuse me, 98 and a half percent of the eligible voters didn't vote. There was 1,100 people that voted out of 81,000. And I have a petition of 800. Had I had a little bit more time, my petition probably would exceed the total number of people I voted on last year. Uh, I think the board has two big opportunities here, one to make people happy and one to possibly create revenue. Uh, making people happy by giving them an opportunity. That's all they want to vote on. Uh, as far as revenue goes, uh, every county that's surrounding Paulding County uh, is allowing people to purchase 
these products on Sunday. Uh, all you merely be doing is allowing the same thing. This is a great opportunity to give something to the residents that not only cost you nothing, but also where you might increase your intake or your revenue. Um, listening to a lot of people speak in the last couple of meetings, everything that they're speaking of is associated with money, tax money needed. And today, I don't think I'd want to be a commissioner because a commissioner's job is much more challenging than it was 20 years ago. People today, as you well know, are very demanding. They want more services, better services, but they don't want to pay more taxes. By allowing these sales, you will have the opportunity to create more revenue through these beverages as they're sold on a Sunday, create about 3% revenue to the county. If you put the math to it, it'll come out to thousands of dollars of additional revenue you'll have to work with that you didn't have before. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that we, we like to keep pooling county sales and tax revenue here in the county where it belongs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's the conclusion of our regular business session. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you all for coming. We're headed. We'll be back here at 2 o'clock.